Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Like a Startup, Onshape's webinar series, where I host fireside chats with experts on startup thinking. I'm John Hirschtick, your host. I'm a chief evangelist here at PTC, uh, co-founder of Onshape. I've spent my life building CAD and PDM software systems, but the best part of my job is meeting cool people who are building future products and who are entrepreneurs and people who are really experts in thinking about entrepreneurship. And in this webinar series, you get to meet these people too. Very exciting guests today. These webinars are perfect for both startups and people in companies of any size who wanna work like a startup. Uh, speaking of startups quickly, um, some of you may have heard of the Onshape Startup Program. You can go to onshape.pro slash startup to learn how qualifying hardware startups and entrepreneurs can get professional for free, get a lot of benefits. We've also started a user group for our startups, which will be, have its first meeting April 27th, 2023. Link to this event will be in the comments sec section today. Now, let's get to our guest. We're live with our guest, David Reamer. David is uh, a fantastic guest I've been lucky enough to get to, to know over the last year or so. He's the Amazon best-selling author of a book called Get Your Startup Story Straight, the definitive storytelling framework for innovators and entrepreneurs. Through workshops, classes, and advising, he's helped thousands of innovators use storytelling to put their products and their businesses, and I'd say themselves, on the map. He's on the professional faculty at the Berkeley Haas School of Business in California. He coaches founders at several Bay Area accelerators. He's a contributor to Forbes.com, where he writes about compelling startup stories. Earlier in his career, he was president of the famous ad agency, J. Walter Thompson in San Francisco. He also held senior marketing roles at tech startups, and in particular was VP of marketing at Yahoo, back in the heyday of Yahoo. Outside of work, he produces theater, was recently chair of the board of the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. He has a bachelor's degree from Brown University and an MBA from Columbia. Uh, we hope you gain tons of insight on storytelling framework through today's discussion. Be sure to stick around for the end of the session for Q&A where you'll have the opportunity to ask David questions. You can start typing your questions right now or at any time during our discussion as comments in your LinkedIn or YouTube window. We'll try to get to all of them during the Q&A at the end. With that, let's get started. David, welcome to our webinar. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. It's kind of the perfect group for me to be speaking with, so uh, let's get rolling. Great, great. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Let's talk, why is storytelling so important for startups and entrepreneurs? Well, it's, it's first and foremost most important because it can actually help you figure out what you're doing in the first place. It, it, building a strong narrative can actually help you refine the thing that you're creating and what your product market fit is, which is the, the foundational thing for anybody creating a new product or a startup based on a new product, is you have to make sure there's someone who needs something, you have to figure out why they need it, what exact problem you're solving it, and how are you solving it better than other people, and that's strategy. But if you think about it through the lens of a narrative, you'll end up with a richer strategy because you'll always consider the customer in the middle of that story. So it's both a strategic tool, and then once we have that strategy in place, we gotta get other people on board. Uh, and storytelling is a very inspiring tool and a powerful tool uh, to get people to act uh, in the way we want them to act. Yeah, and that's uh, so well said. And so you made already one of the first key important points I think our audience should take away is you just said it's a strategic tool. This isn't just a, a marketing thing or something or, or writing an ad or, you know, to go on Google or something. You're talking about really shaping the strategy of the business and the, and the company. Um, and it's centered on the customer, right? It's not, it's not your, your story comes out, but the story is about the, the yeah. customer. It's I can't great. tell you, I can't tell you how many times, John, I've worked with someone and they brought me in to help them tell the story. You know, I want to pitch it and I need to know yeah. the best way to tell it. And by the time we, we spend a few hours or a few days together, 
they're thinking, well, wait a minute, we've actually changed the story in the process of working on the story, because through a series of questions and, and the structure that I bring to people, which we'll talk about today, it forces them to more deeply consider who their customer is, who their best customer is, mm -hmm. and understand why they really need this thing. Um, and, and as you go through that process and they think more about the competitive frame and they think about all these things, they often end up changing what they're doing, um, even though they didn't realize that's where they were going to end up because they just spent so much more time putting the customer in the middle of the conversation. Uh, so anyway, that's the power of it as, as a strategic tool. So when you, um, when you meet a startup, what's the percentage that you feel needy, you, you know, meet even a grade C story? the day you meet them, like versus I, I would say certainly less than half. Less um, than half. Less yeah. than half have an average story. Um, I would say I would say 25 to 30 percent, and it all depends, of course, on when you start working with a company, um, are, are still don't even know what the story is, let alone how to tell it, um, which is why the strategic piece is so important. And even for those who know what the story is, it can always get better in terms of what the strategy is at the core. And, and the story itself, which is where we express this um, in a way that's going to get people to move and act, um, that it can always be made better. That's never done. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, during the course of this session. Uh -huh. um, uh, yeah. And uh, uh, the fact that it's never done is also amazing. So so um, uh, uh, now you, you have developed a, a way, and you talk about it in a book and in your work, I presume, and your classes, I'm guessing. I haven't been to your class. Uh, um, but you have a framework. You have a, a way to think about how to form the story. I know we can't cover every detail, but I think it's fascinating that you have a nice straightforward um, template, if you will. Can you, can you tell us about that? Sure. So one of the things that I realized in doing this work when I started, uh, you know, working with students and startups and, uh, and, and product people is everyone likes structure. Everyone likes some sort of rubric or framework that they can apply, especially people who aren't natural storytellers. So I start by just helping people understand what are the elements you need in a basic story. You need a beginning, a middle, and an end. You need to have some level of detail and you have to have some uh, uh, ability to move the plot along so you don't lose the interest of your audience. Those are some basic storytelling things. But also, every story has a, usually a good story has a protagonist. There's someone you're following, someone you're rooting for, someone you're trying to connect with. And that protagonist has something they want to accomplish, some intention. Uh, and then there's something standing in their way that they're trying to overcome, some conflict. Uh, the great Aaron Sorkin, the screenwriter of the West Wing and, uh, and a few good men and a whole bunch of other things, um, is famous for saying that drama can't exist without intention and obstacle. There has to be someone who's dying to get something, but then there's this big barrier standing in their way. And when we have those and the more of that we have, the better the story we can have. So with all that in mind, I said, how can I make these basic story elements apply to someone building something new? So if it's okay, John, I'll share the framework. I would uh, love that. I think it's a way of great uh, of helping people sort of see what you know what what tool they can use to sort of navigate through this. So um, building your narrative with this, I call this the innovation narrative storyboard. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of a fascinating uh, entrepreneur that I met years ago. Um, and you start with the customer in the story, the protagonist in the story. Um, and, and, and again, remember startup people, you are not the protagonist in the story unless you are the customer. Now, there may be a way to work your story into the story. We may talk about that later. But I want for this purpose that the character in the story is the person who's going to use this solution you're creating. The insight is where we get at these intention obstacles. This is where we try and understand what, what's going on in this people person's life in general or this segment's life in general. And then what specifically is going on as it relates to this area that I'm going to try and help them with. Once we know more about who the customer is and what they're struggling with, then we can start to say, OK, what exact problem can I help them with? And that's the central conflict in the story. And once we know what problem we're setting out to solve specifically, then we could think about what's the benefit of solving it. That's the value proposition. That's the aspiration of the character. That's where the character wants to go if this thing can be solved. Now, after that wonderful setup, now I can tell them what the thing is. 
what is the solution? How does it work? That's the plot of the story. This is where you talk about the product or service that you've created. And then finally, we, we, we make sure that we, we've considered the alternative solutions. That's the setting of the story. Um, and a lot of times these solutions inform the insights because a lot of times what people are frustrated with are the existing ways of solving the problem. I mean, if you were talking about Ubers, the launch of Uber, um, that one of the main alternatives are taxis. And in this section, in the insights, you might refer to some of the issues that people have with taxis and then solve them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with that as the framework, John, I'll quickly walk through this scenario just as an illustration. And we'll come back to, the, to the, some other questions. So um, protagonist in this particular story that Pernotti introduced at a conference about 10 years ago where she was pitching a new idea were non-resident Indian professionals where both parents were working. So they might be living somewhere outside of India, Singapore, Frankfurt, Boston, anywhere, right? And um, what was important to them? Well, they, they wanted their kids to feel more connected to their culture because they were growing up outside of their culture. And they were frankly feeling guilty about not passing culture on to their children in the same way their parents did. Um, they said food really mattered in their life. That's another big part of it. And so how can we you know, get the kids more connected to our culture through food? Now, Pernoti knew she couldn't solve the problem in entirety, but she said, you know what? I'm going to attack the roti problem. What's the roti problem? Well, it takes a while to make good rotis. Roti is a flat bread that's eaten at every, almost every meal, not by all Indians, but by many, uh, many members of the Indian community. And there's 2.3 billion rotis eaten every single day. So her problem statement was, how might we make healthy rotis quickly? The value proposition of solving that is letting people connect with their culture and enjoying these fresh rotis in minutes. And importantly, you see there's both an emotional driver there, which is this cultural mm -hmm. thing, and a functional driver. And John, I want to make sure we talk about those two things more later. Okay. And then in the, how it works, now we can finally introduce the solution. It's a rotimatic robot. It has a particle dispenser that shoots in flour and water at just the right amount to make the dough. Custom heat flow heats it in the traditional manner. And it's connected to the internet. So over time, you can optimize your rotis based on sort of how other people have optimized their rotis. rotis. And then finally, the alternatives are spending hours in the kitchen making rotis, ordering takeout. Uh, and by the time it gets home, it doesn't have that wonderful steaming quality. Um, or frozen rotis, which some people tell me taste like cardboard. And that was the story. And it was from this story that Pernoti went on and she created this product, launched it, built a business. And it, as of now, she sold about 70,000 of these for over $1,000. 70, oh, 70,000. 70,000 for over $1,000 each. Wow. I would argue wow. it's because she's meeting an emotional need, which is this desire to connect and, and mm -hmm. make, make sure they feel like they're not leaving their children behind and outside of the culture, as well as the functional need of having these rotis that have made it so successful. And, um, uh, and this, it's thanks for the example. By the way, what a great example also for our particular audience today, who is probably um, heavily weighted toward people who are building hardware. Machines like the Rody machine are are pretty common things that that our customers and probably a lot of this audience now we may have people who are building software only or services. That's fine, but a lot of hardware people in in my community anyway. So that's particularly relevant. And and so often hardware cannot. Uh, it's not naturally emotional. It's it's a feeds well, I, and speeds or specs. Yeah, and, and let's let's build on that for a minute because this is a product where because it's a food, you could see, oh, that's an easy emotional connection, David. That was an easy one. Give me yeah. a hard one. Well, how about a company like Databricks? Uh, which is, yeah. Right? Which is there building a software. very, very complex yeah. software platform. And in working with Databricks, which is now one of the top pre-IPO companies in the world, um, which is this you know, massive data platform company that started about eight years ago in, in Berkeley, where I, where I live and work. Um, they discovered, and we discovered working together, there was an emotional driver behind the story of the protagonist there. And this, the protagonist was the data scientist. And mm -hmm. the data scientist, we learned, was being hired by these companies to literally save the company. They'd hire these people and they'd say, you know what, data scientist, you're the superhero that's going to save the company because you're going to dive into this data. We're spending a fortune to house the data now in these giant server, server farms. And you're going to find those insights in the data. You're going to hand them to us as executives. And we're going to go out and crush the competition. Go. And then they go back to their desks and because of a whole bunch of functional issues, which I won't go into because of time, they, they couldn't get into the access to data. It was too hard to build programs and run programs. And to make a long story short, they never spent any time 
looking for the insights, they spent all the time building and running the programs that were supposed to help them find the insights. So there was this massive gap between expectation of what they would could would do and and then what they were able to do, and that understand of a, understanding of a massive expectation gap is something anyone could understand. You know, a ten year old yes. could understand that, yes, and that's a very point. human need. So we talked great about point. that human need of the expectation gap, and then we talked about the functional needs that had to do with the ch challenges accessing data. That became the story. So there's a very emotional yeah. driver as well as a functional set of drivers. Brilliant example, and by the way, that's in the book too. Um, you know, just make it a plug. It is a great book. I have no interest in the book, you know, it's David's book and, and he's nice to be here. I'm just telling you, it's a great book because it's, it's really kind of short and breezy to read. Um, it's a good story in itself, really, you know, and, and so, you're, you know, those of you are out there thinking about it, you know, fantastic investment of your time, if nothing else, for a, even a funding pitch that you're going to make. Um, uh, and also the, the Databricks story is cool because I think you said we all can relate to that gap. To be more precise, I think we can all relate to the gap. Um, we're all users of technology. And whether it's our iPhone or our computer, or in the old days, the old Windows computer and LPT1 and everything, everyone has this experience or their new car and the dashboard or whatever. Everyone has this experience of saying, wow, I, I wanted, I bought the tech to do something to you know, write emails or run my business or, or use the nav system, but I have to wrestle with the tech so much of the time. Um, and that's something for me has been a big part of the story of my career is putting CAD and PDM on Windows 30 years ago, now on cloud native. But the point is that really believing we just want it to be more easy to use. And you really hit that with that story, um, something that's very, relatable. And by the way, I can figure out how to use the nav system. I'm not one of these older folks who can't figure it out. I can, my friends are like, well, I can figure out the UI in that car. I, go, I figure them all out. I'm well, so good this is, this is actually an interesting point. Mm -hmm. um, when, when just even talking about this conversation of UI, when the person's building that UI, they have to think about who's that target audience. Um, and it's probably not someone who's developed software their whole life right. um, and lived in the world of UI. It's probably right. the very much a different person. And who's the right. person who's going to be spending the most time in that car? And that's part of if I'm building that, I have to think of the narrative through the lens of that person. It doesn't mean that people like John aren't also going to be driving cars. But yeah. I think like, who's my core target audience for this? Who's the and, and it makes it easier for us to build the narrative when we start to imagine and envision who that right customer is, that ideal customer for our solution. No, it, it is. And um, um, uh, tell me, you talk in the book about the difference a good story can make in fundraising. We've kind of touched on a couple of times mentioning fundraising. Can you give us some specific idea or examples you've seen of the huge difference? Because a lot of our audience, hey, audience, you're looking to raise money. You, you're going to meet with the VC. What can, what can they learn to? Well, let me give you a, a, a nice example of this, because one of the problems that I hear all the time or the challenges I hear from founders and, and product people is like, well, I can't tell. It. They don't want to hear a story. They just want the facts and figures. Come on. Yeah, they're, they're a hardcore VC. They just want to know whether it's going to hey. be a good investment. So I'll tell you this story. Uh, there's a woman named Serbi Sarna, who's a graduate of UC Berkeley, a, a bioengineering graduate and or biochem graduate. And she... Um, was working on an, on an initiative that it, in the area of women's health. And she somehow got ex uh, a meeting with this guy named Tim Draper, who's a famous venture capitalist, oh, yeah. one of the most famous ones yeah. in Silicon Valley. And they're meeting, and um, she had never told him the story I'm about to tell you because she thought it was inappropriate to share in a business setting. Um, but he kept asking her the question, why are you working on this particular area of science? And then she paused and she said, okay, well, I'm going to tell you this story that I've never told anyone before. And she tells him the story about how she was reading a paper on Emerson when she was in, in middle school. And all of a sudden, she felt such a sharp pain that she blacked out. The next thing she knows, she wakes up in the hospital in the emergency room, and they're doing all these tests. And basically, what they're trying to determine is whether she has ovarian cancer. And it turns out that because it's so hard to discover that in a, in a young woman, that, that she could have either been rendered fertile uh, infertile rather, or, or maybe even lost her life by doing some of the tests. And, um, and she set out on a mission to solve that problem And her company is set, setting out to solve women's health problems, starting with early detection of ovarian cancer. 
That's what she set out to do. Well, Tim Draper hears this story and he goes, oh, my God, Servi, you have to tell this story every time, because as you tell the story, I'm learning how passionate you are about it. I understand now how committed you are to solving and how well you understand the problem. Um, and I also feel this story differently. In fact, there's a great video. You could search for it online, Serbi Sarna. Um, where she's speaking, and it's also in the book, where she's talking about her mother and going through this with her mother. And when she talks about her mother, her voice catches. So she gets a little choked up. And she's probably told the story about 100 times by now. But it's just, it's always an emotional thing for her. And as an audience, you feel that. I mean, unless you're a psychopath, we're, we've literally been designed as human beings to have the empathy to feel something when we see someone going through something. And because memory and emotion are linked in our brain, you're up to 20 times more likely to remember that thing I just told you about Servi Sarna because you felt something. And that is the power of sharing a story. So the point is, that is what led her to get her first $4 million of investment. Her major first investor was Tim Draper. She subsequently raised a lot more money. And later on, years later, she sold her company for a quarter of a billion dollars with a B um, to a larger biotech company. That's and, the power of sharing yeah. a story with and investors. To be clear, what you're saying is without such a good story, same tech, same tech, can walk into a venture office like like Tim Draper or one of the, you know, whoever, the, our, Andreessen Horowitz or any of the big names. Same tech, you're saying it can be the difference between getting funding and not getting funding. Absolutely. That's what you're saying here. No question. And that's a powerful thing, I think, for our audience to be thinking about audience. Another key point for you to realize is this isn't about, again, a fluff thing on a marketing website. This is about the difference between you getting funding and not getting funding for your new deal. So pay attention. <laughs> you know, it's and, my and also, it yeah, could be the difference between getting the, getting the sale and not getting the sale. If you go to a, data sale, person, if you go to a meeting with yeah. a CTO and it, when they started and you're telling the story of this poor data scientist, the CTO or the CIO might not even be aware of how much struggle is going on with the data scientist because they got right. a zillion things they're thinking about. Right. If you can walk out of that meeting and that CIO or CTO now feels what the data science feel, scientist yeah. feels, and they're now feeling terrible about putting these expectations on them, that's a human thing. Yeah. They're going to be dramatically more likely to actually buy the product. So it works both as a sales tool with customers. It works with investors. It works with partners. If, and it works with future employees. If you're trying to recruit someone, tell them a story yeah. that gets them to go home and tell their, their partner about this great new company. And here's what they did for so-and-so. They're going to be more likely to say, yeah, take that job. So, so you're going with all yeah. constituents. It's all the constituents. The, the, we talked, you just talked about three, I think. The customer, four. first of all. Customer, oh, four. partners, investors. Partners, investors. And, uh, employees employees uh, yeah that's and, well that's and yeah. what was the fourth or that's that's the three slash four well yeah. you said the book says power threes right so i'm trying yeah. to Good. i've been using that in my Good. personal life you know, since well let's talk about that so yeah. the power of three yeah. is simply that i can only typically remember three things so john has kept ca catching me doing the wrong thing if, if i give you three <laughs> things you're more likely to remember it so yeah. that when you describe a product i always tell product people and founders, come up with three ways of describing your product. Just three points. Make three points about the solution mm -hmm. so that I can I can hold on to that and describe it to someone else. And you can always ladder down other things under those three points. But if you do a list of features more than three, uh, I'm not going to be able to remember it and tell someone else about it. I, I worked with an executive once who, who would do that. And I said, you sound so compelling when you get up in front of an audience for a business problem. Like, like say there's a problem in and we want to increase sales or something. And this executive would get up and he'd, say, he'd always kind of have, I see three key points. And I go, his name was John too. And I'd say, Johnny, Johnny, when you get up there, it doesn't matter what, when you say there's three points, you're going to convince people of stuff just because you always organize it in that way. And now I realize it's a principle. Hey, another thing that I found fascinating is a sense of authenticity in storytelling. And, and it almost, becomes a, a maybe a litmus test for authenticity if if you if you are authentic to your story you, you need to be authentic to get a good story is that correct yeah i mean so occasionally you'll find someone who's inauthentic who's successful uh at least for a while but then then it's also the story where it can come back and bite you elizabeth uh, holmes of theranos is the is most our most uh, famous example of wow we're, unfortunately, we're seeing some others emerge uh, day to day, but she was actually great at telling a story. It just it turns out that part of the story wasn't true. Um, that came back to bite her. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, most human beings will get more animated, will get more emotional if they're telling an actually a true story because they believe it and they're not yeah. faking it. 
Um, and even though there's a performative element to storytelling, the best stories are true stories. The, the that best stories when Serbi Sarna said that my mother and I, when she's telling this little part of the story, we went from being patients to me becoming an impatient entrepreneur. She literally says that in her speech. And when she says, my mother and I went from being patients, that's where she got choked up. So we felt that as an audience. Uh, mm -hmm. There's another story about another startup founder, a simple, similar medical situation where this wife almost died of preeclampsia. And the very first time he told that story yeah. in a meeting, uh, and only because someone pressed him t the same way Draper pressed her, guy, his name was Matt Cooper. That's in um, the book too. I remember. That's in the book. Yeah. She, she, yeah. He, he, he started to cry. He literally started to cry in, in a business meeting. And then he gathered himself, but he told the story of his wife um, showing up in a hospital uh, in Boston, a top hospital, and they're bringing life-saving drugs to save her life. Um, and he realizes that they just didn't know early enough that she had preeclampsia. And then he set out to solve that problem. Now, not every problem is a health problem that's as emotional as those things. But even if we talk about, uh, let me talk about one of their strategy to be authentic and bring your personal self to someone, to some story. You may not be the customer. But you should have met your customers. And if you can tell a story of, I'll never forget the time I met this customer. And someone who does that uh, is a, a founder named Thibaut Duchemin, story is also in the book, um, who starts his presentation for his pitch for a new product that's to help people who cannot hear. He starts his presentation by saying, my parents are deaf, my sister is deaf. It's the yeah. very first thing he says. I know how hard it is to follow a group conversation in that situation. If you're looking mm -hmm. over there, and even if you can read lips, if someone says something mm -hmm. over here, I miss the conversation. And by the way, hopefully you saw in storytelling, I'm literally moving ah. around and acting to try and help yeah. tell this story. But he says, I'm going to miss something. And if I miss it, a few first few words, I miss the whole thing. And there's 400 million people who have that problem. So he wasn't a customer, but because he's telling the story of a customer that he's met, in this case, it's his family, there's emotion brought to the story. And again, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a family member, but any customer that you've seen struggling, if you talk about meeting them and hearing them tell about their struggle, you're bringing that struggle right into the room. So you can bring, you can use your own authenticity, your own and, and your emotions. How often do you run into founders where you, be, they come to you and tell a story, you, you send them back and say, you, you got to go meet some customers. You, you, you detect a low authenticity level or yeah. they're like the business school student who's like, oh, I just think there's money to be made here or whatever. How often does that happen in it, your It your doesn't work? happen that often, but it happens too often because it should never happen, right? Yeah. And I'll, I'll never forget this example where I'm sitting down with a, a founder who's working on a solution um, for a customer and uh, he wanted to build a subscription type Uber service. That was his concept. And he come from the autonomous car space um, and they had problems making that business work in the B2B space. So they said, let's come up with a consumer project. Pro we think we can apply some of this technology to the consumer space. And as he's talking to me, I said, so tell me about your ideal customer. And then he described like a couple where one parent was working and they had a car, but the other parent was also working, but they only had one car. And they go, okay, so have you talked to any of these people? And you said, no, should I? And I practically leapt yeah. across the desk and shook him and said, of course yeah. you should. Yeah. How can you know whether this is a, a, a need or not? So we talked about how they might do that and who they might talk to. They went out and did that. And they came back and said, mm, that's not really a problem that our solution is going to solve. I think we can solve another problem. This was the beginning of the COVID time. And they decided to come up with a solution that was a better way of delivering uh, products and services, home delivery. And then they, they dug into that and they found out that was a solution and they ended up going back to a B2B solution um, and oh. abandoning those two ideas. The point is they were pretty far along in this idea before they'd ever even talked to a customer to really understand yeah. this concept. And, and the narrative changed. Oh. And when you, when you build a story with an entrepreneurial team, do you, how many people do you want to include? And do they all have to be people who have customer um, and authenticity? Yeah. So the, 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 the argument I always make is that um, it, 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 try and keep it to a limited number of people. I typically would, would argue for anyway from four to six. Um, three is kind of a perfect number if you can find sort of the, the co-founders in, in a smaller setting. But sometimes there's one or two other people who are very involved in sharing the story. There's different people who have different philosophies about that, but I would keep it down mm -hmm. to a number about that small. Um, there's a there's a nice question in the in the should we answer that now or do you want yeah, to say sure. that? Uh, well we were gonna you know we we're gonna do questions at the end but since I see the question came in 
Um, by the way, a reminder that our audience can post questions. Um, I know we have people watching on different platforms. It's a little different on each platform, but um, there's a way on your platform you can go into the comments and ask a question. So go, if you're on LinkedIn or YouTube watching, please go ahead and you can enter the questions at any time now. Um, also, as a reminder, I'll ask, um, I think we'll, we'll post a link to the to your book again. And, um, uh, but the, uh, so go ahead and answer it because yeah, if great. you feel it's the right time. So the, the question for those who, who maybe don't yeah. see it is at what stage of forming the product or business should start us be thinking great about question. their story? It is a great question. I would say as early as possible, um, but not necessarily, it doesn't have to be at the beginning. So for example, there are people, let's say you're working on a sensor technology and you've identified a sensor that can use, you know, the power now to be able to put some more, more technology in a sensor, uh, more processing power and, and to put more wireless yep. power so it could talk to something somewhere else. Um, you've built this great technology. That's great. I mean, to people who come up with those things, you know, they're amazing. But at some point, you have to start asking your question, who needs that? And who needs that? And you might have a general idea, mm -hmm. but who needs that more than anybody else? Is it someone on a shop floor and they need it, that on a machine? Is it someone out in an agribusiness setting um, and it needs to be set out um, in, uh, in a field somewhere or any one of a dozen other places it might be? Mm -hmm. And you also, I strongly rec recommend to the founder, you figure out which segment needs it the most, which one is most desperate for it and start there. You can always, as you build the story out, you could say, hey, here's, I think this is most important in the factory floor because these machines are breaking down. Let's put them there. Um, and then you tell that story. And then after you've really nailed that story, then you can, as you, as you get to the, the latter part where you talk about building a business, you could say, oh, and by the way, we think there's all these other segments that we could pursue. But the only way I'm going to be able to remember it is if you build and tell the story about a specific segment, of a specific protagonist. Mm -hmm. And at some point you need to do that, even if it's not when you're building the tech. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's so. Um, and uh, what about people who think that... Um, they should hire someone else to tell the story. Well, I'm just a tech guy. I'll hire someone who's very news anchory like to record a video or something. I think I know your answer to that book. Yeah, I, man, I mean, I want to hear the authentic founder telling the story. Yeah, and and you you're do. always going to be in some setting where you as the founder or the product manager or the person responsible needs to do that. <clears throat> so you really do mm -hmm. need to learn how to do that. There might be certain settings where you'd hire a professional voiceover person to tell the story. Because remember, once we have the story, we've been talking about this, um, you're probably all imagining someone in front of a room and pitching in a venture meeting as the primary sort of way that you're going to express the story. Well, that's just one of many, many, many ways to, to tell the story. Mm -hmm. You could tell the story um, in a one pager. Uh, you could tell the story um, in, in a five minute pitch. You could tell the story in a six a 60 minute deck. You could tell the story um, in, a, in a landing page on your website or in a short 60 second video. And that's already almost a half a dozen different ways. The point is you need to know what that story is. You have to have all those story elements that I shared with you on the storyboard mm -hmm. first. And then you'll find different ways of expressing it depending on the venue and the context. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so everyone, if you're if you're the lead founder or a member of the founding team or a senior manager, you have to be thinking this way. You have to be involved in it. Another fascinating thing from the book is the idea that storytelling isn't just a uh, that that it's not just one technique, you know, for doing it. That there's a neuroscience basis for it. Can you tell, because I find this amazing. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Well, this, this is kind of the cool thing about me getting to work on this stuff and that, you know, when I, I, I've been interested in storytelling my whole life, but I never really understood what I was doing. And it's only since I've gotten into, you know, teaching and thinking about this book that I've really gotten into some of the science behind storytelling. And it turns out that we've literally evolved as a species to learn how to tell stories and to learn how to respond to stories. It's been a way that we've organized cultures. It's a way that we've advanced our, our species literally separated itself from other species, not because we have language, other species had language, but because we could t tell stories about what the future might look like and paint wow. that future and bring other people along with us. And our brains have evolved to have parts of the brain that do these amazing things. There's something called the uh, mirror neurons in our brain that allow us to feel uh, what the what the what the storytellers telling us and activate similar senses. So if I, for example, told you about think about describing a trip that you went somewhere. So I'm going to share with you a brief visit I made to uh, India a few years ago. First that's, time there. That's in the book also, right? Yeah. 
and 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 my wife and I are traveling around, and we're on the, the roads, and the cacophony of noise and sounds. They're literally, we had camels walking next to us, and, and in some cases, elephants on the road, and 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 water <laughs> buffalo, and dogs, and pigs. Um, a, a wedding procession might come by, and the most colorful uh, saris that you can ever imagine, every color under the rainbow, and wow. people are dancing, and a big truck with giant speakers the size of me. I'm six feet three, as big as I am, blaring popular Indian music that everyone's dancing to. So as we had that experience, all these senses were going off in our heads that were activated. I could talk about the smell of the rotis on the side of the road, all those things. Well, when I just told you that story in the last 60 seconds, the exact same senses went off in your brain. And if I told you an emotional story with some protagonist overcoming something and, and I told you something emotional, you would feel that emotional, that emotion. And then the insula, which is that emotional region in the brain, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, is connected to the memory sensors. And it's why <laughs> stories that tap into emotion are things that we can hold on to. And it's why it's been such a powerful thing through history, because you tell an emotional story and then people go somewhere else and they share the same story. And now we're all saying we need to live this way so we can have this outcome. And that galvanizes communities. We've literally evolved to respond to stories in this way uh, because of the way our brains have evolved to help us evolve as a as a culture, as a society and, and as a species. That is astounding. And it also takes storytelling, just like the idea that from a, from this kind of soft, touchy feely thing into the world. Just like saying, "Hey, you're going to get funding or not?" It's, based it's, on it's hard it's science, dark or not? It's yeah, hard science. It's That's hard amazing. Science yeah, absolutely. And it's and, really and the, amazing. The part of this that's yeah. most important to think about. You think about like, well, what's the ultimate objective? Well, the ultimate objective is to make your audience feel like, imagine that they are the customer that you're about to tell me that you're going to help out. Because if I can feel the pain the customer's in, if I can feel that poor data scientist pain of feeling like they've got these massive expectations that they can't meet, or this poor teenager who thinks that she may be rendered infertile because of the, the, this procedure yeah. they have to do to see if she has ovarian cancer, if you feel what that person's feeling, then what are you going to be doing? You're going to be rooting, saying, go solve that problem. Yes, yeah. I want to hear about your solution. Yeah, cool. And and yeah. I always tell people, if you start your presentation by talking about the product, I always just shut them up and say, no, stop. You have to introduce the protagonist. I have to see what they're struggling with. You have to make that emotional connection and the rational connection where you understand what their needs are so that when the product comes along in your storytelling, it's the hero. And it's going to save the day for the person that you've made your audience care about. The That's the power oh, wow. of storytelling. This is great. This is so This is so great. I hope people are paying attention because I want to say I, I've been, uh, I, I've watched a million presentations of startups to venture capitalists. I'm not a venture capitalist, but I've been invited to. I made many myself. And and everything you're saying sounds so true and valid. You know, if any, not, uh, so, some of you in the audience have done this before. Take it from me, who's done a lot of it in the last 30, 40 years. This is all great advice. I wish I had had this advice when I was starting out. I wish I had been able to read your book you know, when I was starting out, it, it didn't exist. And um, uh, so much of business leads you to technical subjects. And this is so great. Um, you, you know, how do you, you know, how do you test, you talk in a, in a book about this, but how do you, so you've got a story, what do you do with it? You, you come up with one, you've used your framework to write it down. Now, what do you just go, do you just practice it and then go into the yeah. presented to a venture person or a customer or is there some other yeah, thing it's a it's a great question and i always tell folks that your storyboard that your story idea is a hypothesis when you come up with it even if you've got a lot of good information that says you think your hypothesis is pretty strong you still have to go out and vet it with customer sets and see if they mm -hmm. agree that this story that you're telling them makes sense let me give you an example of one where the hypothesis was tested and they, it was like nope that's not the right thing we have to change it so a couple of uh, graduate students at Berkeley came up with this idea. They both grew up in families that had small businesses, and they kind of knew what it was like. They worked on their parents' businesses. So they knew what it was like trying to run a small business. And they thought, you know, what would be great is if a small business owner, like, you know, a baker or, or someone like that, could have a resource that was like Yelp for a small business. You go on there, you need someone to make business cards, you research business mm -hmm. cards, you look at ratings and reviews on business cards, and then they choose the best one and you know, and, and there's a business transaction and you get a piece of it. So they go in and they start talking to startup founders. And the only thing, these not startups, I'm sorry, these small business owners like bakers, um, and the only thing they wanted to talk about was how hard it was to hire people. They said, it's so impossible. And then they would ask the question, well, why is that? 
And they would say, well, because we have to use Craigslist. Well, what's wrong with Craigslist? And then they would go through a litany of things, and Craigslist became the antagonist in the story, which, by the way, is another storytelling technique. If you've got something that's broken, that's the antagonist in your story. In any event, they came up with all these ideas and all these reasons why they hated Craigslist. And finally, these two founders, Ben and Maya, said, you know what? We should be building a job service for local businesses. And that's what they did. They built a business called LocalWise. They built a job hiring service that was just customized for that size type of business. Um, and they built it up and they ultimately sold it to a larger uh, job wow. site company. But they, they test their hypothesis. It was the wrong hypothesis, or at least they felt there was a better hypothesis. And they pivoted. They changed their narrative. They built a different solution. And off they went to success. Oh, that's, um, and, and so, so the, the, and the testing you said earlier, you're never done, right? You're always, yeah. you're always refining it. So, um, uh, uh, your book, the, another great thing about the book is I, I don't know that I've ever seen a book with so many examples in it. So you, you are using, essentially, you, you use, there's lots of stories in your book, right? Was that a deliberate thing that you said, I'm going to pack this with more examples than anything I've seen, or did it just evolve that way? Yeah, there's several deliberate things about the book. That's one of them. I've, okay. And it's also how I teach, and it's also how I do sessions like this. You've noticed I've already told a handful of stories. Yeah. That maybe you'll remember the story about the power yeah, of telling yeah. a story, because I told you about Serbia Sarna, or I told you about the roadie Matic. So those are all... Uh, that I use those illustrations because you're more likely to remember them. And most importantly, you're more likely to remember the points I'm trying to make. But there's mm -hmm. another thing I want to point out that's, you know, trying to eat my own dog food, as it were, is can you hold up the book title again for a second? Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, well, also, we can run it on the screen. Too. Well, we could do that later, too. But there's the title, uh, Get Your Startup Story Straight. So if you hold that up, the, the title of the book is The Value Proposition. The, the benefit of this, I always tell people the value proposition is complete the sentence, now I can. Now I can what? Now I can do something I couldn't do before. Well, if you read the book, now I can get my startup story straight. straight. That's mm -hmm. the value proposition. And then the other thing that a product uh, maker or a founder has to create is a product descriptor, which is a simple phrase that describes the thing that lets you get the benefit. The benefits get your startup story straight. What's the thing? Well, what's the subhead? Hold the title up one more time, if you would, John. You're being very helpful here. Thank you. All right, um, great. At least I can do something. To, it's hard to see. It's drop the thing a little bit. It says it, it get your uh, oh, the the definitive, oh, you see there top. it is. The definitive storytelling framework for innovators and entrepreneurs. That's the product descriptor, right? So what is the book? The book is the definitive storytelling framework for innovators and entrepreneurs that will let you get your startup story straight. Thank you, John. So the purpose in the book is I wanted to sort of demonstrate those two really important parts of, of telling your story. When you build a website and you get to that landing page, tell me the title of the, of the product or the company, and then say, here's my value proposition and here's the product descriptor. Some people flip those. It doesn't matter. Either way, I need to see what's the benefit of using this and, and what is this? What is the thing? And if you can do that with just a handful of words through an economy of language, you're, you're, you're on your way. And um, let me go to another thing. So many topics to ask you about your background. You have a really interesting background. How did you get where you are in your career? You know, so, uh, particularly going back early. So it's a great question. I mean, it's one of the things about being an old dude is you look back and you it, it starts to make sense because you see all the pieces that hang <laughs> yeah. together. Uh, not to lump us in in the same bucket, John, but you know what I mean. Uh, so I know what you mean. <laughs> I, I look well. back and I was telling stories of eight year old. I'm an eight year old kid in third grade and I'm writing the story how the koala bear got his pouch. I was fascinated by stories. Terrible story, by the way. There was no beginning, middle, and end. I reread it recently. It was horrible. But I loved stories. And then later on in high school and college, I wrote for theater, wrote shows and things. And I've always been interested in that. And professionally, I got involved in storytelling. So that was a theme that held together. But it wasn't until I, I got to uh, Berkeley and see just how desperate people were for this that I decided to bring it all together. I've had this advantage in my career of having these two parts of my life. I've got this business part and I've got this theater part um, where literally your the, the end product is a story. It's not a product or service. The story is the product or service. And because I've spent a lot of time working on building stories in my theater life, I've been able to bring some of that thinking about story structure, about the kind of things that lift the story to make it emotional and evocative, and, and I bring them into my startup world. So I've, 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 I'm not, there aren't a lot of people who have sort of a full theater life as well as a full business life. I've been lucky to have those two tracks, and full. they come together in the book. 
They do. And you also talked about improv theater. You had an exercise from it. Have you done improv? Your, your uh, I personally am not an improv person, but I okay. do improv exercises in the class. Okay. And um, there's, there's, there's several of them that are, and there, some of them are in the book where what you're trying to do, there's one improv exercise called color in advance. You could actually, you could just do this after this call with a friend where you tell a story and you're the storyteller and you have your friend be the director. And their job as the director is to give you one of two prompts, either color at a certain point in the story, in which case you give more detail about that moment in the story or advance um, where you move the story along. Why do we do that exercise? Well, any storyteller has to constantly balance the moving the story along so you don't lose your audience and putting in just enough detail, like in that story about my trip to India with my wife, so that you're in the story. You're literally feeling that and accessing all these senses um, and you need to find that proper balance so you don't lose your audience by having too much detail, but you also don't sort of miss some of the real power and texture of the story by moving too fast through the narrative. Oh, that's a great, um, a great uh, drill. Um, let me go to, um, time's flying by here. I want to go to a couple more questions before we wrap up. What's the difference between branding and storytelling? Well, so I think branding is a very complex exercise. Um, and I don't even know if I use the word at, word at all in the book. And I mean, I grew up on branding that. and advertising. I don't think I do because branding yeah. is a very uh, complex exercise where you think about all the attributes, usually of a company, um, and all their products and services. And you try and find a way of, of basically telling the story of the, of the company, but at a very sort of high level. And, and my focus, at least for this book, is trying to figure out how to tell the story of a product or a new feature for a product that's just a little bit more specific. Um, there's lots of things about brands where you think about brand values and brand attributes. And although we can bring some of those things to this, these storytelling techniques, it's a little bit sort of like of a 201 exercise. And I'm trying to focus on that 101 exercise of just getting the story straight for that new innovation you've created. But there is storytelling is obviously behind the brand. If you think of a brand, famous brand like Nike or Apple, two of the most famous brands, there is a narrative about the kind of person who's inspired by those brands and uses those brands and what they're trying to accomplish and how the brand helps them accomplish. That's all part of a brand story. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, th that's so interesting because I also find, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the whole subject of marketing can be confusing and misunderstood by um, by the new entrepreneur, especially one that comes from an engineering background, which many entrepreneurs do, or they're product visionaries, maybe not from engineering, but they're yeah. product, they're trying to center on the product or the technology. And I think that that your your book is 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 a better place for them to think about uh, marketing stems from the storytelling rather than the storytelling stemming from the marketing. Would you agree with that? Is that yeah, absolutely. I mean, at, 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 at its core, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people who aren't familiar with marketing assume that it's advertising. It's the same thing, right? Yes. That's what they go to, that they yes. imagine an ad, that's marketing. Well, yeah. the, the marketing is four Ps and one of those four Ps is product. And, and always the most part of the marketer's story, the marketer's job is to make sure they have, a, they, they understand the product story and that there is a product story. And this work that we're talking about when you're the founder of a startup or a product manager, maybe before you have a big team, is you are the, you are the person building that story. So that's the number one thing a marketer has to do. You're doing that job. So whether you have a marketer doing it or you're doing it, that product story is the foundation for all marketing. You have to know who the customer is, which is a strategic decision. You have to understand what the issues are and how you solve them and how you solve them better than the competitors, which is the point of differentiation. And then we can apply that to all these other things, including an ad, which is just one of a zillion things I can use as a marketer um, yeah. to attract customers, trying to retain customers. So marketing, as, as founders and entrepreneurs, you build the story and then marketing, like you said, you use the story in so many different ways. Marketing is an, a catalyst and consumer of it as opposed to authoring it for extra yeah, right and, or as, as opposed um, to just sending it you don't send it to marketing you as, as an organization or as a team you have to decide what that product story is and and it's great to have a marketer to be a part of that process um but it's not just the marketers you don't outsource that to marketing you have to do that as a, as a core team um i'm gonna go to questions i see some questions that honestly i appreciate um i see one in particular from the audience but i don't think it's relevant to the topic here i'm going to stay true to our audience and our story for today Go to one here. I'm going to go to one here. Is one question 
is how to unify product stories. I'm not sure what the author of that question exactly meant, but maybe you could take a shot at how do you yeah. unify? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a really good question. If you're a company with multiple products, yeah, that's what you know, that may be what they're yeah. talking about. How do you bring it all together? Um, yeah. And it is a challenge, and that that is often where you're moving from that broad product narrative or that you know, that specific innovation narrative to maybe more of a brand story. That's part of that lifting it up to a brand story. Nike has a zillion products, um, but the the protagonist in their story is that amateur they have professional athletes but their court the people who they make money on they give the professionals their stuff for free the people they make money are these amateurs who see themselves as like really hardcore com they're competitive people they want to do their mm -hmm. best and they want to just go out there they don't want to talk about it they want to go out there and they want to just do it right they, they want to go out there and they're going to give their their all at every turn and they've built this persona so whether they're they're making a jersey or whether they're making a basketball sneaker or a cleat uh or a yoga outfit whatever it is you're going to give your all to that and that's a persona and now you're building a brand story about someone who wants to achieve um in some athletic in, environment or some physical environment um and they want to have the best tools to help them achieve and they want to feel like they're going to help them do it but at the end of the day it's most mostly them. And now we're building a brand narrative. And then you introduce all these products that are best they can be to help you be a competitive striver. But you still have to bring most of it yourself because that's what it is and just do it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we've taken all these product narratives and you could have a product narrative for that cleat and that yoga outfit that are very different, um, but they lift up to this larger brand story. It's to a larger, a more story. complex exercise. And you, you do that kind of work, right? With well, I mean, I, most of my career, I've done that as a marketer, yeah. but but uh, the important lesson for, for this session is I wanted to come up with something that anyone could use. You don't have to be a professor. You don't yeah. have to go to graduate school in marketing. Right. You don't have to take marketing yeah. classes. Anybody, an engineer, someone who has a new idea, uh, a product manager who isn't trained in marketing can take this framework and then take the storytelling techniques, which are in the back of the book, where we talk about ways once I've got this framework, I can lift the story by telling a personal story um, or by uh, uh, romancing the problem uh, or, or coming up with this antagonist strategy or promised land strategy. There's all these different strategies in, in the book that talk to you how to lift that story once I have that framework. But the point is, anybody can do these things. I don't need a marketer to build a complex brand hierarchy to do the work that this book lets you do. Well, that I think is a great way. Unfortunately, you have to wrap up. I mean, the time has flown by, but what you just said there in closing is great. Anyone can do it. It's so, whether you're starting, you're thinking about starting a company from nothing in your garage, or you're at a huge company and you're coming up with a proposal for a, a business idea, a new product you have, the lessons of today, the lessons in the book, I know are very useful. I can't thank you enough, David, for joining us. I think we got an audience lucky enough to hear from you is going to benefit a lot from what you covered today. To our audience, um, thank you for tuning in today, whether you watched on video or listening on audio, whether you're here live today or listening to a recording of this in the future. Um, uh, thanks for your attention. We we want hope we made it useful to you. I want to let you know that our guest, um, once again, David Reamer, you can reach out to him directly on LinkedIn. He's willing to do that. He even is allowing us to post his email, which is reamer at berkeley.edu. It's here's on the screen, R-I-E-M-E-R -E -E at berkeley.edu. Um, he, he's, he, read the book. It's a great read. And also reach out to David if you want more assistance. Um, he, he's done it for many other success stories who's raised money, sold companies. He can do it for you too. Um, so thank you so much. I also want to emphasize our audience, those of you who are interested in Onshape, you can stay engaged with Onshape by just subscribing to our LinkedIn and YouTube channels. Check out onshape.pro slash startup to learn how qualifying startups and entrepreneurs can get into our startup program, get Onshape Professional for free. Again, David, one more time, thank you so much for coming today. I, I hope you enjoyed it. I, sure I loved did. it, and and I want to yeah. I want to thank you, John, for doing this program. I think it's great that you offer this service to oh. your community because there there aren't enough uh, resources for people who are trying to start out. It's hard, um, it's hard. and uh, it's really great to give them uh, some of these tools that you do on your on your pod and your your webcast. So congrats on that, oh. it's, and it's been fun to be a oh. part of it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and um, and I do it because I have fun and I learn things too.
because I'm still learning. I'm still learning from even just this last hour. So that's it for today. See you all next time on Think Like a Startup.